As uh, Ruben mentioned in his introduction, um, research is very important. Uh, but after the uh, starting conversation, the starting speech of Mr. Harry Nye, which was more about the inherent values of circles, uh, about the spirits behind circles, uh, Mechtel and I were talking in the, in the break and say, well, um, we hope it won't be too boring because research is something else than an inspired. And then I, um, I remember the quote, I heard somebody like, maybe the spirit can also be in research. In any way, the, the devil's in the details. Um, research has been very important for the spreading of circles throughout Europe. And it has also been very important in our project, Circles for You. Um, Mechtel and I from Avans University have been um, uh, the leaders of the, together with Romulus, Petrina, who is sitting on the front row, have been the leaders of Workstream 3 in the Circles for You project. And together with researchers in the partner countries, we have supported the work during uh, Circles for You with research. And that's, that's what our um, presentation will be about. We'll first talk a little bit about the role of research in project development, only very shortly to explain why research is so important in an area like this. Um, then the main part is the research itself. What have we done during the last uh, two years, which is Workstream 3 in the Circles for You project. Workstream 1 is unifying circles, making sure the European circle movement has shared values, shared goals, shared approaches. And Workstream 2 has been the operation of circles, which has been the actual starting of circle projects in uh, Latvia, Bulgaria and Catalonia. We will talk about the supporting role of research um, by using a movie about COSA made in Canada, in British Columbia. We have um, uh, fragmented this, uh, this movie into separate parts, and every part really underscores, and underscores the most important research questions that have been answered also during the Circles for You project. We have also done this because we will be talking for almost two hours, uh, so we needed some relief for our voices and maybe for your eyes too. Uh, and we also want to make sure that it would be a little bit more interactive. So when we come to the different country reports, Ruben will assist us again and ask some of the researchers to have some, give us some first-hand experiences and stories about the development of um, COSA in their countries. And we'll end with some of the conclusions of the, uh, of the project. Well, very basically, um, uh, there was this um, uh, classic book, Realistic Evaluation, at the end of the uh, 20th century. Paulson and Tilly wrote that. Um, they have very clearly outlined the importance of research, not from an academic or fundamental point of view, but for a, for, for a practice point of view. Why research is so important for practice. When we translate their knowledge to circles, we can ask ourselves three questions about circles that we also looked at in our uh, research. Circles outcomes, questions like do they work? What effects do they have on the core member, but maybe also on their social network? What effects do they have on volunteers maybe? Second po important research questions are the processes. How do circles work? This is very important if we want to share knowledge with other countries, with other projects, because then the, how circles work works becomes transferable. You don't have to reinvent the wheel if you want to start a new project. How can we improve circle processes? And the third one has been of uh, great importance during the Circles for You project, because the context in which circles operate, the organizations that adopt circles, the uh, prisons that look at circles, the ministries and policy makers that look at circles, but also neighborhoods and volunteer organizations all together are the context of circles. And we, during Circles for You, introduced circles in that context. So this leads to very important research questions. What, how and when are circles and outcomes processes affected? What kind of factors are important? What do we have to know around circles to make their implementation and their 
uh, their sustainability a success. Basically, people around circles don't pose questions like this. More like the Paulson and Tilly way, the, the, the outcomes, the processes, uh, and um, the context are not basically questions you read. For instance, these are more down-to-earth questions that are, that, that are asked many times in the media. When we, Mechtild and I, or people from the Dutch uh, probation who carry out the Dutch circle, circle projects, talk with journalists uh, from newspapers or television, they ask questions like this. Who are these volunteers? How many circles are there? Does it work? There we have the outcome question again. Do core members tell volunteers everything? Because we have heard some other stories about core members. What do they think of COSA? What do they do in a circle? These are important questions the media ask us to inform the public and circles need the media for their implementation and uh, to stay in their countries. And to answer these kinds of questions, you need research. But not only the media and the general public can profit from answering questions through research, there are others that can profit from it. At number one, the Circle's project staff can be assisted in improving their actions day after day by looking at uh, the capacity of Circle's. How many people, how many funding, how many um, uh, re new regions do we need? What is the right uh, pace to go with? But more, also more detailed questions about circles can be answered through research. The selection of core members is very important. Did we ask the right core members to join a circle? Have we missed people that might otherwise could have profited from circles? These are very important research questions. And then of course training, coaching, supervision of volunteers also to be followed by research and the quality management when you come at the, th at the threshold between research and auditing. Auditing is mo more like an ongoing research if we see that the quality of circles on the long run has been sustained. Which, and you can also call that a type of research. Of course, funding agencies and policy makers need research. The Canadian example Mr. Reverend Nye just told us has partly been um, uh, I think partly research can be the answer for informing governments about the importance but also the success of circles. At the outset, it was a moral argument that convinced uh, the stakeholders in Canada to say, if maybe it's not our policy, but it's important and it works, we're going to do it. After many years of circle processes, you need the facts also if you want governments to continue funding circles. And of course, what I've already mentioned, media, general public and professional public need information about circles and research, research can help with that. I will give you the microphone now. Thanks. Um, we are going to see the first fragment of this uh, wonderful video from British Columbia. And what this video basically, basically shows us is um, that any project provider, when he starts to want a project, needs to know the fact. This is the basic question that is posed in this uh, fragment. Do we know the facts? What kind of facts do we need to know about um, the sex offenders? How many are there? What will be the capacity? What, because that defines the capacity you will need in your project. What, what types do we have? What about their risk and their needs? But also legislation issues. What happens in this country, in our region, when sex offenders are arrested? What are sentencing policies? Are there forms of conditional release? Is there a national not notification or sex offender disclosure scheme? All those sort of facts you need to know because you have to work with them. And also, how is treatment organized? Who is providing it? When and where? Is it in prison or by probation? Or are there mental health specialists providing training? Um, how is the sex offender management in the community uh, organized? Which services are in place? Who is doing what? Do professional institution, institutions collaborate? Or is everybody working on an island by himself? Do they exchange information? 
What kind of infrastructure is there already in place? And how is the supervision organized? And finally, but very important, into what society climate are sex offenders released? What are community reactions? Is there vigilantism? Or are sex offenders simply ignored? Depending on all those different national circumstances, the COSA model and the possibilities for high quality implementation needs to be fine-tuned. And sometimes the model, especially the organizational model, needs to be adapted to the national context. In the Circles for EU project, all starting and orienting partners conducted a national adaptation study. And after this movie fragments, we will tell you some of the results. Small town in the BC interior. A sunny September afternoon. <coughs> Neighbors, for the most part, know each other and consider themselves part of a community. But what happens when someone new comes to town? Perhaps someone with a past, someone the media has called a high-risk offender, someone imprisoned for sexual assault. How would you react? How would your community, including those who have been sexually assaulted, react? Is this a community's worst nightmare? It doesn't have to be. This film is about an alternative community response, a way of responding to fear and community safety, a response with this bottom line, no more victims. We fear the idea of a sex offender being released to live among us. Do we really know the facts? Does the community, does society know or want to know the facts? Very few child victims are assaulted by strangers. In more than 80% of cases, the victim knows the perpetrators. And yet, the most pervasive community fear is that of a stranger, often called stranger danger. We have a specific idea in our head as to who and what an offender looks like. And we seem to think that they're the scruffy, mean-looking person that'll have a sign on them saying, I'm the bad guy. We only have to look into our backyards to find somebody that could hurt us or our families. They could be in our own families. They could be friends of ours. We have to be cognizant of the occurrences around us and not just what we read in the papers. When sex offenders are apprehended, many end up in jail. Some serve part of their sentences, and a few will serve every day of their sentences with no parole, and are then released. When he is released, everyone worries. We worry about the safety of our communities. We've seen in the news, we've seen personally as police officers, suspects reoffending. And then we have more victims to deal with, as well as an outraged community, and then the media. We don't want these things repeated. When convicted sex offenders return to society, communities are told through public notification. Public notification is when we advise the media that a person has these conditions and they'll be living in your community, or that the person is missing or uh, AWOL, um, absent without leave. And Part of that is for public safety, of course. What usually happens with that is that that public notification is picked up by media sources, newspapers, television, radio, um, and it's broadcast far wider than the immediate community that has been notified. And that often fans the fear. Um, the information that's passed out through media resources often is just the headline, um, and that's all we get to, uh, get to hear. So often what can happen is that a community can become gripped by that, seized by that fear, and a sort of a frenzy takes over. But what the public often misses in media reports is that there is excellent collaboration and communication involved among police, corrections officials, prosecutors, and the courts. In addition, high-risk offenders are released under strict supervision through what's called 
an 810 order, a mechanism designed for public safety. There's a provision under the Criminal Code of Canada for 810.1 and 810.2s, and those are a very comprehensive number of conditions that are put in place so that we can monitor the person. They would have the support of a probation officer as well as knowing who the police officer and the community is to be able to report to. The overall goal is number one, public safety, and number two, the reintegration of the offender into the community safely and with support. Imagine for a moment what it's like for an offender when he's released after being incarcerated, sometimes for a decade or more. You're so overwhelmed with the larger picture and the larger things that you have to deal with. Um, just the emotional stress of being in prison for, for many years and coming out into, into the world again. Um, there's that issue as well. It's incredibly hard. One of the biggest fears of fellows that come out of prison is that everybody's looking at them, that they stand out in some way. I don't know how an offender is supposed to succeed when they get out of jail and they don't have any money, and they don't have a job, and they don't have any housing, and they don't have any supports, and the only person that you are relying on is a probation officer and a police officer who technically leave at five o'clock. It just, logically, I don't think you can s succeed easily. One of the chief factors in sexual offending is isolation. Uh, isolation and fear and feeling awful about oneself in, in, in many cases. So the community response, that's what happens. It's counterproductive. It doesn't help uh, community safety. It makes community safety worse. It make, puts people at greater risk. When an offender comes out and is faced with all of the newness of the community, and had, if he's had little experience of living in the community, stress is often a trigger. Stress is, is very often what brings people back to prison. They, they have a hard time coping because of stressors. So there's two ways that that person can, can come out of jail at the end of, of their sentence. They can come out without any support whatsoever um, and try to manage what happens next all on their own. Or they can come out with support. And that's where COSA plays an important role. So we've just seen the first fragment of the British Columbia mov movie about what do we know about the facts. We have seen some people talking about the factual situation of the reoffense rate, the law systems in operation, uh, and also the existence of COSA. In British Columbia, it's only one example of what you could say a national context, uh, context a jurisdiction. And this jurisdiction has been carefully studied by the British Columbia people in order to make the start of COSA as good as possible. And what we did in Circles for You was actually the same. We asked the starting countries, Latvia, Catalonia and Bulgaria, and also the orienting countries, the countries that will start with Circles very probably later on, to um, do an adaptation and feasibility study. This means look at your own jurisdiction ranging from laws to community responses and answer us, answer um, uh, your policy makers, answer, uh, 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 report in the European Circles for You research group the results to see what kind of solutions are best for circles in your country. So we're going through these uh, reports now and we'll of course only highlight the most important results of these studies. And I will ask Ruben to, uh, to, uh, to help us, because many of the researchers are in the, in the, uh, in the, in the room. Um, the first report we want to discuss is the, um, the adaptation study of Latvia. Um, the university uh, uh, conducted the research, but the project provider, like the organization that has started the operational side of cir circles, is the State Probation Service of Latvia. So here you see some of the results of their adaptation study and you see more or less the answers on the questions Mechtel posed just before the fragment. Um, 
For instance, in Latvia we found that there is a very short tradition of specific sex offender legislation, supervision and treatment. This probably has to do uh, that the state probation in itself is uh, uh, only uh, is, an, is an organization with not a very long tradition. There has to be, after the change in Latvia, um, um, uh, the state probation has started and has to had to put many things in place. So this is a, an issue uh, when it comes to Latvia. As an answer to that, the Latvian probation has. Uh, imported expertise and tools from Canada, Canada, the United Kingdom and Norway, for instance, a structured risk assessment and also a sex offender treatment program. And here we find two very important elements that have to be in place in a jurisdiction to start with COSA. You have to know the risk level of your potential core member and you have to know if around the volunteers there is a possibility of treatment of a sex uh, uh, offender, of a core member. And there are pilots of MAPA-like structures. MAPA is an, uh, is an invention of the United Kingdom. It is an abbreviation of multi-agency public protection arrangements, which is like a fixed group of people around released sex offenders. And here we find an element which is important for the outer circle, the people working around the, uh, the, the inner circle of volunteers. So these things have been found in place by the Latvian researchers. On the other hand, there have been some setbacks as well. Um, not really a tradition in volunteering or, or restorative justice, which circles in a way are also. And there have been cutbacks in budget due to the financial crisis. So in red, underneath, we'll find the, ma the major conclusions of the Latvian report that the COSA model is, an, is an really an addition to the already existing national expertise and also existing capacity. So it doesn't found, find an empty ground, it finds uh, a, a ground that has already um, uh, uh, has many ele elements uh, in place for COSA to be welcomed. And it is modeling restorative justice practice, which is also an important conclusion. Um, so Ruben, maybe uh, we could have a this is, of course, I'm reading up the slide, and I think exactly. if you do the yeah. research, the people who did the research are in the are in the. Okay. Who's one the one who room? did this research? <laughs> where, 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 where are you? Somewhere. <laughs> if you're sitting next to someone who did this research, maybe you can point at him or her. It's more easy. Yeah. <laughs> Over there. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There. You know them, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, maybe. <laughs> no. no, no. Uh, and first of all, the first question, of course, would be: Do you recognize the results? That's very important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah wait a minute, it's, it's now switched on. Yeah. No, not yet. Yeah. We change the microphone here. Uh, that works. Thank you. Yes, I recognize, of course, everything that's uh, on, on the slide. I, I thought that somebody from the University of Latvia will be here, but I guess nobody is, so I'm, I'm from probation. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> But prob probation is also the project provider, isn't it? Yes. So then I can ask you some questions. Yeah. <laughs> because as a project provider, of course, you're also using this sort of information. And I was wondering, for example, a, a, a thing like um, heavy cutbacks in budget due to financial crisis. It, it means that on one side, there's the, the people are really willing to implement things like COSA, but there are really financial problems, isn't it? Uh, yes, and that was one of the main reasons why we postponed implementation of uh, COSA nationally by several years. And uh, because of those financial cutbacks, we postponed also introduction of MAPA. Uh, we started with pilots in 2010, uh, finished them in 2011, 
then we had three years uh, uh, when people voluntarily came together on a voluntary basis from different kinds of institutions to, on, to work on separate cases, but it was not structured and funded by the state. And from next year, we are moving back to this idea and, and we'll introduce uh, MAPA nationally. Okay. And is, is COSA, is when, when you're talking about COSA within your organization, are there just a few people working on it? Like, like, okay, this is one of the little projects? Or is it really a, a, an important thing for the probation service in Latvia? Uh, not many people are involved, I must say, but it's a mm -hmm. very important thing for probation service because we are now yet no, exploring and, and, uh, and uh, trainings are done, but, uh, but more for, for volunteers and, and coordinators of this uh, project, not, not so much uh, for case managers. And, and I, I think in Latvia that's something we will work on, on, on training case managers more about this approach. Because we have, you know, also in headquarters, uh, people cautious about this approach. Uh, so we are slowly building up this confidence into this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Latvia from you or Nechtel uh, or Bas? No. Oh, thank you. It's clear. Yeah, okay, for thank you. Us. Yeah, for saving. <laughs> okay, I will give you this mic. Uh, also, uh, of course, here in Catalonia, the Circus Cut team did an extensive uh, adaptation uh, study and we just wanted to highlight one of the elements of this uh, adaptation study. Um, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm mixing things up. Um, the, the project provider here is, of course, the directorate of the prison service um, and some of the results of the uh, adaptation study explains some of this big success here, I think. Um, they found uh, a consolidated sex offender treatment in prison already. Uh, Long-term supervision was in place. Uh, sex offenders can be supervised in the community for up to 10 years. Um, and there also was an infrastructure of collaboration between the police, the prison system, social services and volunteer uh, organizations. There is also this wonderful open regime uh, to support uh, offender rehabilitation where COSA f can fit in um, and structured risk assessment was in place and uh, also uh, there has proven to be a, a good collaboration with the university and um, they support with the evaluation and the quality control as I have understood. So all in all, uh, it appears that COSA fits very well in the current landscape in Catalonia. And there's much support from the professional and the community organizations. And maybe some one from the Circles Cut team can maybe comment or illustrate one of these points. Carlos, thank yeah, you. Carlos. We will answer myself and, and Antonio too. Antonio from the university and, and myself from the organization of Sir Claire Scott. Okay. okay. Huh? Uh, I'll hold mark. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, um, what is the, the yeah, Just to point out, for, okay, for example, yeah. because that's of course, that's why we're also here with the whole conference. And as we heard also with the, with the opening of the conference, everyone looks very, uh, have a lot of sympathy for this whole idea of COSA. And that's, of course, also the, the model fits well in the current landscape. So w what's the reason why you think that it so fits so very well in, in what's happening now in the, in, here in, in, in Spain? Hmm. Um, bueno, yo creo que la principal razón por la cual hemos contado desde el principio... Oh, sorry. I wait for the translation. Yeah, I take this one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, eh, creo que una de las principales razones por las que desde el principio contamos con una buena aceptación del proyecto Círculos, bueno, yo creo que hubo dos razones. La primera es que teníamos tradición en, en los servicios penitenciarios y en ejecución penal en Cataluña de trabajar con programas sociales tanto dentro de la prisión como fuera de la prisión colaborando con, con entidades sociales y eso 
Y, y eso yo, yo creo que ayudó mucho, ayudó mucho a contar con, con este apoyo. Y después, que, que seguimos bastante el consejo del manual de Circles, de European Handbook, o la experiencia de otros países respecto a la importancia de hacer una buena difusión del programa. Entonces fuimos con mucho cuidado, pero a la vez, paso a paso, intentando dar una eh, información al público, a posibles voluntarios, de cuál, es, de cuál es el modelo Círculos y de cómo funciona y por qué. Y, y finalmente yo creo que es que el modelo Círculos es un mensaje muy claro y muy directo, y muy poderoso e incontestable. Es, sirve para re, reintegrar al delincuente y para evitar víctimas. Y eso, si se explica bien, yo creo que atrae mucho la, el apoyo. No. Sí. Sí. Uh, I will go to the university later on. Just one other question, because we saw it now in Latvia, and we heard it also about Canadian uh, society, that uh, the, the, the impact of, of um, uh, uh, slowing up the economy, so there are also economy problems, of course, here in Spain, but this doesn't affect probably COSA, I think, or does it affect it as well? <laughs> yes, it affected. Um, de hecho, cuando, cuando empezamos en 2010 pensando en aplicar cosa, en aplicar círculos, eh, hicimos la propuesta al Departamento de Justicia, a, la, a toda la estructura, y tanto la estructura como nosotros, nos hicimos, la primera pregunta que nos hicimos es, está muy bien, es perfecto, es, creo que es una cosa que necesitamos, pero ¿cómo lo vamos a financiar? <coughs> Perdón justo en el momento en que la crisis está la crisis económica en España está en su peor momento ¿no? pensamos bueno vamos um, vamos a empezar vamos a, a in, tuvimos la suerte de contar con el proyecto europeo que nos da un poco de financiación tenemos la experiencia de colaborar con la fundación La Caixa que nos ha ayudado a financiar otros proyectos sociales y con este pequeño empuje empezamos a aplicar círculos con la esperanza de que, de que era una cosa que iba a funcionar, que se iba a ver que realmente valía la pena y que íbamos a encontrar la forma de financiarlo en el futuro, pero sin tener toda la seguridad, eso es cierto. research Uh, how do you involve or how do, are you involved as a university in doing the research and are you also helping to give arguments for COSA? Because that's also very important, of course, to explain to others why it's working. Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I am Antonio, I am from the Barcelona University and I'm working with the project until the, they're starting because we uh, make some years ago working usually with the prison services in Catalonia in research and we have a, a very um, interesting project between them. And we have uh, made three tasks in this project. The first task was uh, collaborate with the guidelines of the project in an European way and mostly in European survey of, about attitudes of, uh, of the people about this kind of treatment. The other question is uh, testing some in, uh, risk assessment tools mm -hmm who you're using in, in uh, Catalonia, yeah, like SVR20 or uh, Static99, to, to, uh, to, to test what, what kind of usefulness has in the, in the practical way. And the third uh, task is that new questionnaires like uh, SPQ and others to monitorize and uh, to, um, to put some evidences about the changes in the core member during the, the treatment. This is our task mostly. And this is more very uh, shared with uh, prison services. But it, it makes it also sometimes very political because people want to know the results. Yeah. And, and are you willing or are you able as a university to deliver, all, deliver results? Or do you say, okay, this is not our job, we are scientific and we're not into policy? Yeah. No, well, uh, we have a, prepare a publish uh, for the criminologist and other professional, like in uh, writing Spanish languages, obviously, for all the people to know mostly about the project, because the prison services are more um, uh, responsible to make some media diffusion. We have more diffusion between our colleagues and other professionals, and mostly in teaching in criminology, psychology, and other 
uh, graduate students in the university. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. There was a, a question over there, yeah, or a remark, yeah. Sorry. I just passed by. Yeah. Hello. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Eh, mi pregunta, bueno, yo soy Laura Negredo, trabajo para la Administración Penitenciaria Española y estamos pensando en desarrollar este proyecto también en nuestra administración. Estamos evaluando eh, la posibilidad de hacerlo y tenía una pregunta para Carlos. Eh, a la hora de poder convencer a los políticos de que esto es una buena idea, eh, estamos hablando de que el coste-beneficio de este proyecto... Eh, a veces es complicado de defender, dado que, por ejemplo, en Cataluña son tres círculos, son solo tres agresores, solo entre comillas. Todos sabemos lo difícil que es trabajar con este perfil de, de internos, de penados. ¿Cómo es posible argumentar en, eh, a favor de esta propuesta, dado, dado el coste-beneficio? Gracias. Gracias. Um, I, I will ask Carlos, but it's also a question for, for uh, Bas and Michelt, because it's, it has to do with, with money. And as um, the Reverend already mentioned, it's, 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 uh, you said it's, it's, it's cheaper to organize it this way, but some people are discussing it, if it's cheaper or not, or uh, is it efficient? And especially if you have only three of them, how efficient is it? Hmm. Bueno, respondiendo a la pregunta... Um, Recuerdo precisamente ese momento, el momento en el que, además, en el momento que tuvimos, en que explicábamos a, a, a las autoridades políticas eh, el proyecto Círculos, les decíamos, mira, esto es un proyecto que vamos a hacer, que cuesta dinero, que cuesta esfuerzos, y, se hace con, y lo vamos a hacer con tres delincuentes sexuales y para eso vamos a reunir a mucha gente. ¿no? Además, nos hemos encontrado con esta situación dos veces porque entre medio ha habido un cambio de gobierno. Entonces, nos ha, pre, nos ha preocupado bastante. Yo creo que una de las hubo dos creo recordar dos cosas que influyeron bastante. Una es que al, al, cuando empezamos cuando empezamos a explicarle a nuestros nuestros jefes el proyecto Círculos le dijimos mira esto es poca gente pocos internos pero con un potencial de riesgo y de daño para las personas enorme ya lo sabes y, con, y que despiertan una gran preocupación en el público y eso no hace falta que te lo explique y además, mira en, en Canadá eh, cogieron 44 delincuentes sexuales que participaron en el programa, 44 que no participaron y consiguieron reducir la reincidencia en un 80% entonces funciona pero además, como estamos en, en un proyecto europeo, uno de los actos que tenemos que hacer es el, el la primera presentación pública del proyecto, el kickoff. Te invito a que vengas y, y participes en este, en este kickoff. Y recuerdo que aquello fue quizás no tan multitudinario como esta, como este, como esta conferencia, pero casi. Eh, entonces, al acabar, eh, comentamos con, con los responsables políticos, con el responsable político en aquel momento, cómo había ido y tal. Y, y recuerdo que me dijo, hombre, esto despierta mucho interés social, esto es una cosa que preocupa al público y es una cosa con la que podemos contar con bastante apoyo. Entonces, es eficaz, preocupa a la gente y, y contamos con apoyo social. Yo creo que estos son, en nuestro caso, fueron los tres, las tres claves. Thank you. Yeah. I was wondering because Bas Vogelman, you mentioned this morning that now in the Netherlands there are 50 circles. So does it become more efficient in the end? In the sense that, uh, uh, of course, you have some overhead, and then after circle five, six, seven, the costs get lower. In general, you can say, uh, although I'm not really in the position to answer that because, like the. The calculations are being done by the Dutch probation services, but it's very logical to say that after the starting period, where you have to uh, form uh, a team of coordinates, you have to do many more things to attract volunteers and train them, uh, uh, selection, uh, more media efforts, uh, uh, more hours investing in getting local networks interested and uh, supportive of circles, that in the starting phase, there is many much uh, many more costs involved than at a later stage. That is, uh, that's, that's logical. What's often forgotten that even after circles have been 
um, operational after a long time, they still cost money. Circles are not for free. Uh, the, uh, the, the work of the outer circle professional is largely, uh, of course, uh, the work they usually do, but there's extra hours and, and investment involved. Then there's the supervision, the activities of the coordinator, mm -hmm. the traveling costs, the insurance costs of volunteers, and they all add up to a certain amount of money that in a cost-benefit analysis you can use against other factors that happen when somebody uh, reoffends or when somebody is in custody and the costs involved, you're trying to prevent through circles. That's the calculations many people make. Mm -hmm. but to answer your question, they will all, they will always, uh, circles will never be cheap, so to say. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the third adaptation. Ah, a question. Oh, remark over there. Yes. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry to introduce. Uh, uh, we have to put off some microphones because they are now getting noise between. Yeah, just put that one off. There's a button on the front. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, a cost to raise uh, the question of cost benefit, it's uh, always a very important issue. But I'm sorry to say, in this case, it's a nonsense. And I, I would argue as such, in uh, if uh, uh, professionals couldn't solve the recidivism then they need the help of the volunteers. So it means that we don't, as a society, we don't have any professional results, any professional tools to solve this problem. And if we don't have any other tool, then cost-benefit is not a question. Yeah, but of course, for politicians, they always find questions. Okay, okay. And, but, they, but, and but, they could very okay, easily say... Let's, if, if let's it's spend the money for something else yeah. which has better results. But yeah. there is no other tool. But they do think that if you lock someone away and throw away the key, it's much cheaper. Okay, that's that's the argument. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they're using yeah. that argument, of course. Yeah. So, okay. we, th and the uh, question, of course, is can you deliver research or information to convince politicians? But already, not only the three uh, cases in uh, Catalonia, not the three cases in Bulgaria, not the three cases in Latvia were analyzed and studies, but more than thousand cases. Yeah. And that's, that's what a, is a compar comparison. Okay, well, short reaction over here. The, the UK had a cost-benefit analysis undertaken, commissioned by Circles UK three years ago. That was done by Birmingham University, and it costed Circles at £11,000. So, translated to euros, I don't know, 12000 Now, they also calculated that the cost of a reconviction for one year was £147,000. Do the maths. That is not including the hidden costs of family breakdown, mental health treatment, uh, loss, of, loss of earnings from uh, whoever's convicted. We have now done further work. We are quoting £9,000 as an average cost per circle. £9,000. That's against £150,000 for one year reconviction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bulgaria. Bulgaria about the cost benefit it has the cost benefit itself has the danger in it that we start calculating costs and benefits of circles and forgetting what society would like to invest in community super in community efforts to reintegrate uh, people and to prevent victims some of the values within circles are it's it's difficult to 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 translate them into uh, into money, and we know we have to do the calculations, but to do only the calculations is maybe a dangerous area where we, as a circle movement, would like to be. There's all still always the more inherent values, and they are, are they are priceless. The uh, the third um, by starting country was uh, Bulgaria. With, uh, this was done by um, Andre of, uh, of IHA, which is a non-governmental organization based in, uh, in uh, Bulgaria. And it's also the organization that provides the circles. Now, you can probably see on the bullet list that the situation, the starting situation for circles in Bulgaria was quite different. Uh, than the situation we found in um, Catalonia and the situation in Latvia. Um, 
Although we agree that the outset that many of the GO criteria for Bulgaria were in place to start circles, during the project we found that we had to repair many things to actually have a safe haven, for sur haven so to say, for circles. Um, on a political level, sex offender management was not high on the agenda. They were seldom released on probation, which was more or less, I think, the gating situation we also found in, uh, in Bulgaria. There is a, a release without conditions. Um, lack of expertise and capacity in sex offender treatment. Uh, no structured risk assessment in place and little commitment from the professional institutions that you need to have involved for the outer circle. So during our project, in order to have a safe start of circles, several measures were taken. For instance, the import of expertise on structured risk assessment from Latvia. And as a, a result of the research was also that based on the situation in Bulgaria, a more Canadian-like approach would, prob would probably be more suited for uh, Bulgaria. COSA fills a gap, but maybe not in the way that it's like highly structured and within the, the justice system, so to say, as in California, uh, Catalonia and in, uh, in Latvia. So that's more or less the picture. I'm, I'm not sure if the researchers of Bulgaria are in, in the... It's a research from yes. Bulgaria. Yes. Over there. Yeah, hello. So, this, yeah, you have a microphone, please pass it through. First of all, as I would like to apologize may, may ask you to stand up for a here. moment. May, may I ask you to stand up, then people can see you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. I would like to apologize that Andre is not here, and uh, we can do that in this information because he is our researcher, and we are the coordinator and have information about our circles. Okay. Yeah, it's a pity he's not here, but you're here. That's that's wonderful. So that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, what's interesting here is, of course, as we were talking about uh, Latvia, we we're talking about uh, Spain, Catalonia, um, but also this connection. In this case, import of expertise from structured risk assessment from Latvia. That means it's already really becoming a sort of network. Everybody is sharing their information. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We import this uh, expertise uh, st structure risk assessment from Latvia and uh, we can uh, share in our circles yeah. and uh, our organization have um, a center uh, for rehabilitation and integration for s sex offenders and there we can import this risk assessment program. Yeah. Wonderful, yeah. thank you very much, thank you, thank you you're here. That's, that's interesting. Do you, is there also research on, on this connection between all the different countries? And, uh it was not really a research question, uh, but mm. it's something that autom automatically happens in a project like this because it was built in the project plan. That's why we were successful as a partners to get the funding from the European Union because we built in all these kinds of exchanges and possibilities for exchange in the plan and we also had Elizabeth as liaison officer who traveled th th uh, uh, in between the starting and orienting countries to make sure that these connections were established. Yeah. France. France. Uh, France was one of the orienting countries, not just uh, looking into the possibility to have circles in the future, not starting circles within this project period. And uh, Florent Cochet and Alice Delage of the Centre Hospitalier de Charles Perron, I hope I said correctly, <laughs> with the program areas, um, have done uh, some research into the feasibi feasibility of circles in France. Um, and I, if I am um, correct, these are some of the points that you uh, highlighted. Um, there's much uh, support for, for COSA and uh, both from the professional as from the, the public community. Um, there are specific sex offender policies for treatment and supervision, those are in place. Uh, volunteering is a common practice. Um, 
in, in social services mainly, but not so much linked to probation. The, however, there are some uh, points that need to be dealt with. Um, the context is generally meeting all essential criteria, but there is no experience with st structured risk assessment. That's something which is not s so much developed in France as in other countries. Um, and there is some point about the funding by the government. Um, they need to make sure that COSA is a secular organization because from dating from the very specific French history, there is a law that says that only secular organizations can be funded by the government. So no connection with church, uh, churches anyhow. So maybe, um, Ruben, you would like to illustrate the whole row. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Maybe you should try Alice. <laughs> Alice, you must be Alice. Hello. Hi. Um, I will just try it like this. Yeah. Well, uh, stressing the last point because that's interesting, of course. Because we, we were talking about, with the Reverend about the, the the connection to religion, and at the same time, everyone could be volunteer, even if you're not member of a church. So how how strong is this point? Does it really run a risk? for implementing COSA in France? Uh, well, in France, effective uh, secularism is very, very important. So every volunteer could uh, be, uh, uh, could have religious ideas, but uh, not in the organization for uh, a COSA, because the government can found uh, sec uh, religious organization. It's something very important in France. Okay. But if you know that, you just say, okay, it's secular. That's very easy, isn't it? You, just, you don't talk about it, you just say it's secular. Yeah. Or is it, are they really checking and that you're not allowed to be a member of a church? Or is, this, or is it a little bit too naive, this? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure it could be possible <laughs> for us. Um, it's um, only about the organization. Uh, um, well, in France we are free to believe in, <laughs> in God or another, but... Uh, but. Yeah, because you're orienting now, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. When does does circle start in France? What, what do you expect? Uh, it will be one circle, two, three, oh. ten, twenty. <laughs> zero. Zero. <laughs> Currently zero. Currently zero. But do you expect it from, from next year or 2016 uh, or? We we hope next year. I don't really know. Yeah. But uh, uh, yes, currently the the other problems is the risk assessment tools. Yeah. So we we have to. Uh, to in France, professional uh, don't like these tools because they uh, they have fear yeah. about wrong prediction, and yeah. uh, we don't you, have you a good. Ask, you, yeah, you can ask Bulgaria because Bulgaria got from Latvia a great yes. risk assessment. <laughs> yeah, so that's yes. maybe you have to share this information. <laughs> we are thinking about uh, something to experiment these tools and not uh, just for COSA and not for other things. Okay, great, Maybe thank we, you. we could like that. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Yeah. Second orienting country, Ireland. Um, the, uh, of course, um, uh, there's only two conclusions here on the, on the slide and there's many more things that have been said in the report. But the situation in Ireland, based on these points, is very positive. There's a high level of professional and political support. The structure for embedding COSA, the different points we saw on the other slide, is in place. And actually, a pilot project by the probation uh, service, uh, with, on with, under which the transfer of the, the actual operation of circles will be transferred to an NGO, has, been, um, has started. So at this moment, there is no circles running, but very in 2015 there will be a pilot and one of the conclusions also is that media planning and media strategy is crucial in Ireland which was one of the conclusions okay. especially in Ireland okay Who, who's from Ireland 
Over there. Yeah. Hello. Hi. <laughs> oh. oh, you will get a microphone. Yeah. Um, that, that last point, because I think uh, media planning is maybe uh, essential for every country, but it's especially mentioned here in Ireland. What's happening in Ireland? That's it's so important to use this, this media strategy. Well, uh, may I ask you to stand up as well, that everybody can see you. Yeah. yeah. Um, Brian Dack is my name from the Probation Service in Ireland, and um, we are on the cusp of the journey into to circles. Uh, I'm accompanied by my colleagues here from uh, PACE, which is an NGO organization that the Probation Service has a long history of working with. Um, and they are uh, going to partner us in, in the development of circles. And we're delighted that um, we've got the financial support to do it a, mm -hmm. on a pilot basis. And uh, within the next two weeks, we will be interviewing for our coordinator. And, in the uh, next two weeks? In the next two oh, okay. weeks, yeah. And, huh. and, and kicking off the process. Um, I suppose as, as a, a government official with the Department of Justice, um, uh, we've kept the media at arm's length um, uh, traditionally, uh, but we do recognize that um, to tap into the, the, um, the good uh, history that we have of, of volunteerism in Ireland, uh, volunteering is very, very popular there, but to tap into volunteers to, to make that step into uh, working with, with uh, these type of, of offenders um, would be a big step, and we need some positive uh, support uh, via the media for that. And yeah. tomorrow, to, in to recruit volunteers, or is it the, uh, the moment that you choose for a, for approach like COSA that there could also be some negative reactions in the media? I, no, I don't think I don't think necessarily there's going to be negative uh, reaction to the concept of COSA or the implementation. There is negative um, reaction to uh, sex offenders coming into our communities uh, from prison. And uh, in a workshop tomorrow, we're going to explore that. And Stephen Hanvey is is, is going to uh, point a way forward for us in Ireland in terms of uh, uh, media. Um, our experience to date is, 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 has been mixed. I mean, we've had this, just recently we had um, a, a two-hour, two-program two documentary on the probation service, which was a fly-on-the-wall documentary, which was very, very well received by our national media. Um, I suppose our social media might have had a different uh, response to it. Yeah. Um, but within that, there was, there was an element of, of working with sex offenders in the community and, and the challenges that are posed for probation officers, particularly around accommodation um, and the harassment that, pe that people receive within the community. So it's a, it's a challenge for us, it's a task for us, um, and we think that, that we could probably go under the radar and be very successful, but we think that going out and coming out, so to speak, is something that we have to uh, tackle yeah. and, and, and deal with. And that's, that's a challenge for us going forward. OK, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. The last orienting country. Uh, the last orienting country is uh, Hungary, uh, for which uh, Soralta Laura Horvath and Geza Gostoni and his whole team, I uh, uh, heard that some other uh, prof professions were also involved in the uh, adaptation study. Um, from an institute which name I do not try to, <laughs> to, to say because it's so difficult. Um, but some of the results uh, uh, of, of your uh, research into your own country, into your own national context, showed that uh, there are some barriers to uh, providing COSA projects, and those barriers have to do with the penal code and the legislation, especially for sex offenders, which have been renewed lately. Um, there has been a reorganization of the probation system, which makes close supervision of sex offenders a rather difficult task, uh, uh, and mainly this task has been shifted from the probation system to the prison system and there are lots of capacity problems and expertise problems probably. Um, there also is no accredited treatment program for sex offenders, so you would have been in trouble for finding people for the outer circle. There is a structured risk assessment is not yet available. Uh, it will be uh, in probation from 2015 and 2016 in the prison system. Um, 
All in all, the funding is a major problem. Funding for NGOs, to secure the funding for NGOs is more than difficult at the moment. And um, so Hungary concluded that it may not yet be ready for COSA in 2015.